All right, guys, so first of all, I want to thank everyone for welcoming me here this semester. I understand I started out, you know, as your long-term sub, and then I've sort of filled in around the, you know, around the school in various days here. I'm just observing, right? But um, you guys have been patient. I hope I've contributed a little bit here. I think I'm really technically just supposed to be observing, but nevertheless, right? All right, so today's lesson is going to be it's related to the overall idea of globalization to a degree. It's also sort of a standalone lesson because, uh, because well, technically it's, just, it's what I'm learning in my class, so I have to sort of teach about that, but I'm gonna relate it as best I can, all right? So the first thing comes first, which is we do now, which should really be not beforehand, but spend a couple of minutes and considering the following things. One, in two or three minutes, think about and write down at least one way that COVID-19 has changed your lifestyle within the last two years. This shouldn't be hard. There are a lot of changes, all right? And then two, take an additional one to two minutes and think about what pre-existing knowledge you have about the Black Plague, which sounds very spicy and dramatic because it is. So spend the next couple of minutes, three to five minutes, whatever, and think about it amongst yourselves. We'll discuss it, then we'll move on, all right? These are not getting graded, really. This is, this is a discussion point, so just please. Take another two minutes or so. Take another 90 seconds-ish, no, maybe another minute, a minute and a half. Are we good? Yes. We're good to go? All right, so give me something. First, we'll start with COVID. How is life different? And by the way, again, there's no right answer. Like any, like you guys can pick whatever you want. How is life different? Zach. Absolutely, 100%, right? I mean, do we shop in stores anymore? Well, I mean, well, some of us do, right? But I, I would say that, you know, a huge percentage of people now get everything delivered, right? What else? I'm sorry, you used to be very social and now you don't like to talk to anyone? Well, all right, I mean, I'm sorry, but, but <laughs> I, no, 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 it's fine, but you're right, isolationism, right? Like that's become a much more thing, being self-contained, right? Both, both people and societies, right? What else? Like wearing a mask on the train. Wearing a mask on the train, right? Different protocols for transportation, different abilities to transport yourself at all, right? I mean, that's, these are all huge things, right? So again, this is the last two years, okay? Life looks unequivocally different. You know, in, sort of, in educational theory, this would be referred to as like a chronosphere event, right? Which essentially means a time, like a time completely and totally defined by an event which is taking place, right? Like in my earlier youth, um, in 2001, there was this thing called 9-11, right? Like that would be a chronosphere event. Everything changed after that. Similarly, COVID-19, everything changed after that. And it's very easy 
to think to ourselves that we're living in a unique time, right? That being said, we are living history, guys. Like 50, 100 years from now, people will be reading about today and be like, whoa, what was going on, right? I, I, I appreciate that perspective. So in terms of, why are we studying history? I mean, this seems like a very loose question, but I sort of like asking. Because it's a required subject. I, I'm not looking for answers. I'm kind of just, I'm just, you know, I'm being rhetorical at this point. But because it's a required subject, sure. Because we enjoy studying history, I do. I think maybe, maybe Zach does, I don't know, but I, I certainly do. Because um, it's interesting and compelling. Thank you, whoever said that. I, you anticipated the next one, right? To inspire book, film, and television productions. I mean, sure, you know, there, there are, there's great historical fiction out there, right? But um, here's where we're getting into the more meaningful ones. For a richer understanding of the systems which have developed over time. If I was asked in grad school the other day, like, how do I define history? I always say, like, the evolution, interaction, change, and reaction of systems of human behavior over time. Right? Like, that's essentially what it is. There's natural history. There's geologic history, whatever. There's every type of history. But like, this is what I find most interesting, and frankly, what you learn most in school. Right? Related to that, because we want to know how the world take on the, took on the characteristics it now exhibits. That's a huge one, right? And then, and this is a real point of today's lesson, because human behaviors and activities create patterns and they recur again and again and again. Okay, like technology gets better, Zach's absolutely right, okay? But we as a species, we have not really evolved in 100,000 years. It, maybe longer, actually, depending on how you look at it. Like our brain capacities haven't really changed. So in terms of behavior patterns, like there are commonalities. There's things that repeat themselves again and again and again. And in theory, we learn from the past to not repeat them, but uh, our success with that is kind of marginal, right? How do we, well, okay, this is that source. I'm going to skip this because you really don't really know this. Primary, secondary, tertiary textbooks. This will be fiction short, but certainly late. All right. Now, this slide got a little chewed up, frankly, so I'm going to have to read this to you. Yeah, it, it's written, but it's written in black ink, so it's not going to do anything for you, right? But um, the total reported of infections. Okay, from COVID-19 as of yesterday was 514 million globally since it began, right? And there have been about 6.2 million deaths. And that's a lot. Okay, there's a lot of people that died. Again, it's over the course of two years, right? If you do a little statistical analysis, there's 7.9 billion people in the world, all right? So the infection rate overall, five, 514 million against that, okay, it's about one, one, I'm sorry, about 6.4%, right? Less than 10% have been infected. All of those infected, the amount of people who died is about 1.2%, right? Now, if you multiply, take it out, like the amount of people of the world who died, okay, it's not 1.2%, it's about 0.07% they died. Okay, that, can, that actually is a lot of people. I mean, I've known people who died, I'm sure people in this room have also, it's very sad, right? But like, Within a matter of perspective, like it, there have been worse plagues. There have been dramatically worse plagues, and that's really what we're gonna talk about today, right? So to give you a comparison, all right? Uh, this is gonna go here. Population impact. All right, so here is a little graph of the population of England. Again, by the way, it's much larger than England, but this is just where we have a really sort of useful graph, okay? You see from 1086, it, it should really be 1066, but whatever. Up, 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 slow, gradually increase, right? Until about 1348, we got 4.8 million people. Then, instantly and immediately, it drops from 4.8 down to about 2.5. All right? You're talking about a nearly 50% wiping out of the entire population of our country. Question? I think, I think it wiped out almost one third of Europe. In terms of all of Europe, different countries were hit in different ways, right? So, England, who happened to be very urban. There, there were a lot of urban centers, so it got hit harder than most places, but you're absolutely right. Across the board, estimates vary, right? Like count, counting death rates 700 years ago, it's not an exact science, right? But yeah, somewhere between a third and a half, some countries even more, right? But yeah, like think about it. If we're talking about centuries of development, centuries of population wiped out. It would be like waking up tomorrow, or I guess in three years, and all of a sudden the population of this country is what it was in 1720, okay? Think, like, you can't even think about the ramifications of that. It's almost inconceivable, right? And it took hundreds of years to get back to the same place, right? So the ramifications for this sociologically, economically, politically, culturally, it's 
infinite, right? Yeah, not, not in England, right, between 50 and 60 percent. All right, moving on. Da, 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 da. Why is this not going? Okay. So we're talking about globalization. We like to think of this as a modern thing, and it is kind of things like industrialization, transportation networks, right? The internet, above all else, has shrunken. Again, figuratively speaking, has shrunken the size of the world, right? That being said, 1350 is like not even two years after the play began. And look at this phrase, all right? This is the vast majority of the quote unquote known world, right? All of Europe, most of North Africa, down into Egypt, China, India, the Middle East, Central Asia, Russia, the Golden Port, like the pretty much the whole world had this thing. And we're dying in tremendous, tremendous numbers. So the idea that global interaction and flow is a new thing is really completely inaccurate, right? It's just that it happens faster. It happens much, much faster and things are more interconnected, right? Right, so here we've got a map specifically in on Europe and a timetable. Yeah, question? Uh, do you think that maybe COVID was like kind of similar in the way that it affected people, but it's just technology developed more, so it's now I'm making it kind of Well, like you're jumping the gun a little bit on this, on this lesson, but yeah, I, I, the answer is to a certain extent, yes, I, I agree with that. There are notable differences. I think that it's playing out in the political field is a little different um, because, again, popular opinion and popular sovereignty and voting patterns affect the way in which society interacts with these things a little differently, but yeah, generally speaking. Question, because we got a lot to get through, so. Uh, I, I heard a theory that the only reason that Europe is prosperous is because of the bubonic plague, is because of Genghis Khan launching uh, his dead soldiers into a fortress that had the plague. A couple things, one, Genghis Khan had been dead for about 50 years already. Uh, no, no, but that being said, what you're right about is actually his successor kingdom. Right, like the Golden Horde, Kublai Khan, whatever, they're the ones who are like his grandchildren or great great grandchildren. And you're actually right, it was there invading certain areas in Central Asia and Russia that actually sent large population migrations away. So you're, you're right, actually. But again, they didn't quite know that at the time, but we do now, right? But again, in terms of trade networks, right, we're talking about one of the things of globalization is trade networks, right? If you look at the timetable of where this played out, again, right, so we got Central Asia over here, the Black Sea, right? This is the first region that gets it, right? And yet areas that are right next to it over here actually get a lot slower than the Mediterranean Sea basin. Oh, this is not what we wanted to have happen. Yes? No? Okay, I think we're good. Yeah. So like, uh, right, so like over here, in northern sort of Scandinavian world, it gets it much, much later than like Spain. For instance, right? Even though it's a lot closer, really, to the area where it starts, it just, it's just it's this whole thing. Understand the relationship between trade and spread. So frequently, we talk about calamities, wars, revolutions, etc., famines, plagues, whatever. Like, like it's it really is kind of the meat of what we study in history, and there is a reason why. Is because you know major change comes from a people. It just almost always does, right? So socioeconomic, political, cultural. By the way, you could go write pages and pages and pages and pages and pages about this. I'm boiling it down to its essence. That's kind of what we always do here, frankly, but like that's what there's time to do, right? Before the play, feudalism, do you guys remember what that is? And if so, what is it? Right, okay, I would say it's both a social system and a political and an economic and frankly a military system also. It's all of the above. It's essentially how society organizes itself. And this is a very loose estimate from like seven, 800 AD straight through until about 1400. I mean, it's, it's just the dominating form, right? And yeah, there's a king, right? But really the economic realities of what governs society are lordship, right? Like I would be the Earl or the Duke of Manhattan. I mean, I'm making it up, but like the point is, and then Everyone on that island doesn't own anything. Their job is to work the land because everything is derived from food and goods, right? Like, I mean, there is money, but it's not the main thing that suits the economy, right? So it's all predicated on the idea that there's lots of available land. I'm sorry, there's not that much available land and tons of people to work in, right? That's the only way that this system works, right? Um, what else? 
the church. And by the church, we mean Catholicism, because at this point, there really is only Catholicism. That's not entirely true. There's Eastern Orthodoxy and whatever. But like when we say the church, we're really at this point referring to the Catholic Church. This is the 800-pound gorilla in Europe and in the West in general, right? This is, it has a virtual monopoly on learning, education, medicine, scholarship, philosophy, everything, okay? Not just that in your worldview. Like the way in which you relate to one another, society, the political environment, God, the afterlife, everything. The church is it. It's the only game in town, right? So it's where you go to to get every answer to any question you have, right? And then, this is like kind of a throwaway, but it's sort of worth mentioning. Literary and artistic reputation. This is the age of high chivalry, right? Knighthood, sainthood, monks, you know, et cetera, things like that. Like that's, the artistic motifs are all the glorification of God. You know, humanity is sort of downplayed except for through its piety, right? After the plague, during and after the plague, really, right? We get what? And this is, if there's one major, major historical thing to take away from this, again, this is really not on the regions, but I just think you guys ought to know it, right? The mass eradication of population, most principally the peasantry and serfs. By the way, church and nobility died also. Everyone died. But the largest number of people were the serfs, so they died the largest numbers, right? Created a tremendous lack of available labor and a steep decline in the demand for food, goods, services, etc. Okay? Surviving laborers were in an infinitely better negotiating position for wages and eventually for achieving land ownership. And what I want you to take away from this is that like the whole idea of capitalism and the development of a middle class, this is what happened, okay? If I own Manhattan and I've got 50,000 people to work in, right? Like, I'm sitting pretty. None of you get getting paid nothing. You can eat as much as you need to live, but otherwise, like, whatever. Like, if you're not gonna do the work, you will, right? Or whatever, right? The point is, that's not the case anymore. If you only have 300 people to work the land that 1,000 people would have beforehand, they can negotiate. The value of their labor has gone up and eventually the value of the land has gone down, right? Because again, like there is, there's nobody to work it. Like, what are you gonna do, okay? So this is a big deal. This is one of the things that sets the stage for early sort of proto-capitalism, not full-blown, it takes a while, but like this is one of the things that plants the seeds. Two, some have argued, I would argue, frankly, um, that the failure of the church to explain or adequately deal with the plague led to a delegitimization of its integrity as an institution. All right? So one of the things, you guys have studied the Renaissance, I think? Was that yet last year or this year? I forget. Last year? All right, whatever. The point is, during, during the Renaissance, right, like there's this sort of turning back to ancient and classical ideas, humanism, It'll develop further down the line with things like the Enlightenment, whatever. But the point is that, like, if there's this giant institution which you go to for everything that you know and everything you believe, and they can't explain why everyone's dying. Like, it's God's wrath? It's this? It's that? Why are monks dying just as quickly as everyone else, right? It's one of the things that starts to sow the seeds for humanism, okay, and a turn away from theological world. All right? And sort of, I think it leads pretty directly to the Renaissance. And far less, one of the things you see from the imagery is that there's much less idealized themes, okay? Portrayals of mortality, something called the dance macabre. Uh, suffering, human-focused paintings, woodcuts, that suggest a far less rigid attachment to religious ideals, okay? So, oh, and then this last one, this is a fun one. Widespread violence against scapegoats and minorities. As with every other instance in the world, when something is going wrong, people want someone to blame. Period. It just happens always. All right? So one of the things that, that happens is anti-Semitism, which is a recurrent theme throughout all history, but, you know, in February of 1349, there was this thing called the Strasbourg Massacre, which is on a French-German border. All right? 2,000 Jews were killed and burned alive. Right? And by the way, this happened all throughout Europe. This is just a really big example of it. And this happened on mass. Eventually, actually, it was the church which stepped up and, and sort of put a stop to it. I mean, they were just saying, like, it's not going to make a difference. So it's, it's worth noting. So here's a couple of artworks from the early, this is like 1310, 1314. I don't have a caption there, but that's what it was. Lots of colors, idealized structures, cities are gleaming, chivalry, you know, knighthood. Everyone's got this haircut that looks, makes them look like a monk, right? Like this is, 
This is the way in which humanity is portrayed, okay? Fast forward a couple decades later, which is really not that much time, and we get, Lord have mercy. And by the way, have is H-A-U-E, right? Because guys, languages evolve too, all right? English in 1348 is not English today. If you go back even further, it's seven or 800, English is nonsense. You wouldn't speak it, it's not a language, right? Or it was, but it's like Teutonic, weird, freaky, right? On, have mercy on London, I follow, we fly. By fly, they mean flee, right? We, double E, die, D-Y-E, but again, we die. It's pretty straightforward what they're talking about. Keep out. We're fleeing, stay out, etc. Like, leave us alone. We've got a skeleton dancing here, right? And then this thing called the Dance Macabre, which is a theme, this is a medieval theme, okay? And it's about the universality of death. You can be a king. You could be a queen, you could be a clergyman, but whatever. The Grim Reaper, and that's like this site here, right, is following and is stalking us at all times throughout the whole human experience, right? It's a very morbid worldview, but again, you're watching your cousin, nephew, Taylor Baker drop dead all within a week. You're gonna start having a different view of the world, right? And then, yeah, this is a, a very famous painting by Peter Brogel. This is actually about 100 years after the plague, really, but it's, it's reminiscent of it. It's apocalyptic, dark, muted tones, etc. You know? Skeletons, horses, pale horse, so on and so forth. All right. So, we are now going to do a group exercise. We've got six groups, which is one, two, three, four. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, I guess. All right. And for the first five groups, we've got a slide, well, they all have a slide A and a slide B. Group six is a tiny bit different, but it's not gonna be a problem, right? What you're gonna be reading from is this guy named Boccaccio, who's an Italian, I wanna call him a novelist. The truth is the novel as an art form didn't really exist yet, but this is sort of early, nascent novel writing, right? This thing called the Decameron, he wrote that in about 13, late 1360s, early 1370s, but he lived through this himself, okay? Like he was living in Florence at the time that the plague broke, broke out and he very, very aptly described what's going on. So you're gonna read a primary document, a little excerpt from there, okay? And then the slide A, which is the second part of it, right? Is gonna be a contemporary headline right here, right now. And by that, I mean 2020, 2021, the last year or two years. Okay, and I'm asking you to do two things. One, describe what each thing is saying, like the meaning. What is the meaning specifically of the statement? And also, if possible, what does it reveal about the society which is writing it, right? And then say, are there similarities or differences or connections between the information and circumstances being portrayed in one versus the other? All right, questions? Yes, no, maybe? All right, okay, let's get started. And for my viewer right now, I'm actually gonna pause you because I, permission slips are complicated, but we'll resume when the class begins, all right?